And now, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere because the time has come for the keynote speech of the day, or rather, the keynote dialogue. And for this part, I would like to welcome Professor Calypso Nicolaitis, the Chair of Global Affairs of the School of Transnational Governance and her EUI students. I actually have more faith in the development of the EU than in the opportunities offered by the government of my own country. I am um, very scared because of the fact that most uh, countries, even in the Union, are not respecting their commitment to decreasing as much as possible their carbon emission. There has been a rise of nationalism in Europe. It doesn't look like in the future there will be any positive out of it. I had uh, more hope before the beginning of the war, of course. I don't see a very bright future for Europe or the rest of the world. I don't think in the next 20 years we'll quite see like enormous effects of decisions that we're making now, but I think future generations will, unless our generation makes a change, which I am not so hopeful about because I don't know if we have the moral and psychological strength to do it. Do I have any specific fear? The main one is the ongoing tension that has persisted between the individual and the collective. To what extent we will be able to find compromises between the rights of the individual and the responsibilities that we have as far larger communities. For me, Europe does not treat us very well. I would like um, there to be more of a sense of unity among young Europeans and hence a network of interconnection. I think Europe represents to me a center where people can connect to each other and also exemplify uh, amazing living conditions. I think my biggest fear for the European Union is the fact that it seems to be dismantling little by little, especially as we've seen through the Brexit and similar French movements. I used to be quite pro-European Union. I still am because I don't really believe in borders. I like the whole global citizenship thing, but not the way it's done now. Signore e signori, is Europe fit for the next generation? As you just heard, I've been discussing this impossible question in the run-up to our gathering with our protagonist behind the scene and her fellow EUI students from across the world. Because, hey, they are the next generation. Of course, to my social science colleagues, I concede it outright. They're not a representative sample, just a fascinating and privileged one. They can dazzle us with brilliance or baffle us with bullshit. But if by next generation we mean Generation Z, born before and after the next millennium, too young to be in charge but too old not to care, well then, it's them. We talked about many things, but we found it really hard to make predictions, especially about the future. And especially when you're bombarded every morning uh, by news of war in the Ukraine. Thankfully, this conference has come up with brilliant answers. Thank you, participants, for your scan of EU fitness. 
It's muscular actions, it's flexible regulation, it's resilient institutions. You're probably thinking, uh, as we've heard in the last two days, this is not a blank page. For years, we boomers, we boomers, boom, boom, have done our best to make Europe fit for them. When COVID hit, we even broke all our fitness rules in order to create the next generation fund in their name, 750 billion euros of it. But hear their skepticism. Thanks for the bazooka fund in our name, but if you borrowed it in our name too, can you really say, don't worry, foreign corporation and polluters will pay. And when you spend it in our name with greenwashing at all, shall we not ever say? To which, ladies and gentlemen, you will admittedly respond, your turn will come. We were the next gener generation once, and you are the next ancestors. So where shall the generations meet? I grant you this is not an easy challenge. Polling by our partner, YouGov, confirms what we all already know. We are different species. They watch movies on phone. We don't. They Spotify and Cryptify. We don't. They dis separate toilets and <clears throat> heteronormativity, do we? They say no to plastic bags and any jokes on any minority. So we call them snowflakes. They say meat, no. Father of the bride, no. Have we reached gender equality? Ethnic blindness, we say kinda. They say no. Do they remember 89? No. But please, boomers, Zoomers, don't call the whole thing off, because we've got the translation manual right on time for the French presidency. So for égalité, say community. For liberté, say nonconformity. For fraternité, say intersectionality. Hey, we, see, we seem to speak the same tongue after all. Um, so, our conversation could start with a simple premise. The EU has always been predicated on learning the right lessons from the past. But what if instead we were going to learn lessons from the future? You know, not the way the EU machinery does it through forecasting and foresight units embedded, you know, but lessons from the futures imagined by the next generation. Warning, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a mind game, or not just a mind game, for where better than in this magnificent Salone dei Cinquecento with its secrets behind its walls, can we proclaim, imagination is real. Proclaim that imagination must be the ground on which academics bring policymakers and politicians. How else, some of us critical international relations scholars argue, can we prepare for futures where nuclear deterrence fails? Climate loops accelerate, the global financial system implodes, and bees cease to be. How else can we sustain our democratic societies if those who are learning to be citizens do not imagine themselves as authors of their own destiny? In an age where all others authority figures have fallen, gods, kings, nations, profs. How else can next gen resist the colonization of their future by us, if in that future the dead have tied the hands of the living? So wh where did these conversations take us? Like fellow profs in the room, all my life I felt challenged or vindicated in equal measure by my students on both sides of the Atlantic from when they were my age 
to now, when they are my children's age. But these, these SOU conversations, I found myself more than ever in the predicament of royalty liberal ironist, agnostic about the adequacy of my liberal vocabulary, but impressed by theirs and their display of the enlightenment quality that is so lacking in today's politics and so needed by the EU. Yes, doubt. Doubt of the tragic kind. You're right and you're right. Oh, glorious ambivalence. Or doubt as in paradoxes and blank spaces, as we saw. And doubt about their own worthiness. Stop idealizing us, Kay. And so I had to promise that I would argue this in my own name. Z, forget Russia's recent hijack. For 2,000 years, the letter Z that your generation bears happens to mean, in Greek, to live. It's okay if you don't imagine dying for Europe. We didn't either, even us. You can spell our transnational promise instead with the ways you live the future in your daily present every day of the week, not only on Fridays. So when my generation asks, Europe fit for you? Why not imagine instead what it would be like for Europe's transformation to be powered by next gen software? And what would our Europe be like? if it became you, adopted your look and feel, shed its old skin, and became comfortable in yours. Yes, youth, chameleon, EU. Our journey in three acts, hope, then freedom, and finally, peace. many things where you don't know like what to care about and I, I wrote a piece or I wrote some thoughts down for the speech this afternoon because I was really inspired by what we had said in a meeting but now again I'm in such a different mindset it l literally makes my heart, heart race not in a good way and yeah and I know there are so many people who feel like this and I think it's just so sad. Okay. okay, boomers, let's talk about hope. My conversation with Gen Z's future selves invariably started in a limbo between hope and hopelessness. From a 10-year vista, they plead, save our seas, save our bees, save us old non-human beings. The future and the present put them in a permanent existential angst, even existential angst about having existential angst. YouGov tells us that Gen Z is twice as frustrated, stressed, lonely, sad as us, sad as you heard her after reading, yes, the IPCC report. Thankfully, they're also more energetic and inspired. Yeah, totally whimsical. So, how do we hear their two entangled story? One more familiar than the other. There is the more familiar cycle of life story. Call it being young. We will be worse than our parents. Job evictions, house evictions on our horizon. Um, so what we need for the EU to do in his youth strategy is, well, you know, more universal. Universal income and services. Hey, paid internship and equal pay for equal job too at EUI. 
And then there is the other, there's the parallel story. Call it the cohort story. Z's unique slice of life in the stream of history, where they no longer speak as the children of their parents, but as the parents of their children. The children, too many of them cannot imagine wanting to bring into this world. What's the point, they say, since these kids would hurt the planet and the planet would hurt them? And since these kids' kids would never hear birdsong, climate and biodiversity collapse is our destiny. Um, thankfully, they don't indulge in despair too long. There are techno festivals to go to. Damn it. Um, so seriously, truth is, you Zs are not the weak ones. You despair at institutions that can't prevent self-destruction, and still you step up. You hang on to the hope that if enough of you do the right thing, when you eat and when you heat, when you move and when you cool, this will all amount to something. Because we know that become now what you want the world to be is not just a stupid motto. Because we know that hope is about carrying on fighting when you have to given up on naive optimism. I don't think my generation is truly capable of thinking, living like you do. This tenuous but deep connection between your daily lives and the ripples they create across space and time, between the butterfly and the planet, even as we speak knowingly of the green premium or carbon neutral lifestyles and call you the narcissistic generation. So let's bring on Chameleon EU and find proxies for being you. We shall make the EU's new mantra, it is urgent to act long term. Sure. The EU machinery is rightly proud to have learned emergency mode in the last decade's multi-crisis. Four years to agree or agree to disagree on the Euro debt crisis, four months on refugees, four weeks on COVID, and now four days on Ukraine, wow! And yet, in all these crises, we fail to imagine other futures for each of these recent pasts, when at every juncture, with EU imprimatur, we could have future-proofed loud and clear for two, 10, 50 years horizon. Because let's face it, the EU can't be a classic democracy where you can throw the rascals out. But it can be a democracy with foresight. It can pivot from the politics of space to the politics of time and commit to sustainable integration where we rejoin the paths not taken to these foregone futures that would have transformed yours. To finally transform how we consume and not just where we produce, how we redistribute work, value and risk and reward the burdens of sacrifice. So, will Chameleon EU mainstream eco-socialism by nudging and banning to help our societies and cities act more like us? Will Chameleon EU finally empower those not only in Europe, but in the rest of the world, those least responsible in the past, poorest in the present, and most vulnerable in the future? Social and global justice. And with Ukraine, will Chameleon EU resist the temptation to resource its lethal addictions, slow down cold elimination, give up mitigation for adaptation? Will you, Chameleon EU, heed the young who recycle everything, even their anger, whether they'll have these kids or not? Heed scientist rebellion who have joined them in despair at their tra climate trackers to call for a revolution. EU, you say, we can wait no longer to institutionalize their anger. Prove it. Decarbonize. Hello there, um, it's Athena. 
I just heard that you were one of the randomly selected person for the EU Citizens Permanent Assembly. Like, I'm so excited for you. I was just having a look back at the pictures from when I was at the conference on the future of Europe. Like, was it, what, a decade ago? Like, crazy. And also, like, the fact that we're going to be in the same city, finally, like, crazy as well, right? But anyway, like, I really hope you're excited as well. Like, and what is the topic for this year? Is it digital voting on EU policy or was it rebranded as the Green New Deal? Like, I can't really keep up. And I still have to vote for this week, like European Parliament's proposal, but I forgot my compass login details. Like, do you reckon you can do anything about that? But anyways, sending love and I'm really excited to hear all about your thoughts. Bye bye. Okay, Boomer, let's talk about freedom. About what it would take to dispel Gen Z's hopelessness blues. See how in their utopia, freedom is more than a voice, uh, but the capacity to act act in spaces for radical democracy. EU, if you manage to beat Elon Musk's mojo by 2030, goodbye today's youth abstention. Hello, political emancipation. Here are our five imagined makeover headlines for Chameleon EU. Headline one, 2030 Chameleon EU defies binaries. Forget four, or against us, EU versus national pride. EU versus national pride, both, or anything in between. Since for most Zoomers anyway, Brussels and the member states are means to two ends that matter most, the local and the global. In this non-binary world, a fit Europe has its heads in the cloud hopefully a public cloud, and its feet on the ground. We do want more EU in health, security, climate, but as what the EU does goes up, how the EU does it goes down, all the way down. In this non-binary world, membership is not black and white. When the Albanians and Ukrainians of this world come knocking at the door, we don't say one size fits all. For we learned with COVID how Europe is made of many circles of autonomy, ever bigger ones powered by ever smaller ones, connected together, cities, neighborhoods, regions, cloud communities. Headline two, 2030 Chameleon EU requires enthusiastic consent. Consent, the magic word for these. After future check, Europe 2030 ticks the consent box in zillions of exciting ways. Enthusiastic consent, democratic consent. The next generation wants to consent with passion, not resignation. Not for nothing did 2030, Sarah, remember how 200 randomly selected citizens descended upon us in Florence as part of the world's biggest ever experiment in participatory democracy. And how they decided together then and then in our EUI that their experience should be institutionalized. I remember too how random Gen Z in the assembly understood better than the politicians the old Athenian and Machiavellian democratic intuition that if in individually they could be anyone, random, collectively then they represent everyone. And I remember how they reinvented the meaning of represent as to be present again in a space where the ruled can become the ruling democratic mindfulness, if you will. Headline three, 2030 Chameleon EU champions the power of watching without being watched. It empowers the young. If in their hands, smartphones could wage a smart resistance in Ukraine, they're now mobilized to wage a smart war on corruption and nepotism in Ukraine too. It embraces the power of collective intelligence 
through an EU democratic panopticon, where distributed funds and privileges are exposed for all to see. EU 2030 has set up a mega platform for citizens to take in their hands and to tell their rule of law stories. Is rule of law, after all, not the most precious human invention of all time? And EU 2030 does not hold its punches to empower the foot soldiers of democracy everywhere, journalists, lawyers, activists, civil society organizations. Headline 4, 2030, EU Chameleon EU embraces the Embraces the invisibility paradox? You know how Gen Z wants both hypervisibility, pride recognition, and hyperinvisibility. Ignore my difference. So let Chameleon EU show off visibly what it does best and still become so transparent, so confident, so indispensable that it ends up being invisible, just like any good parent, right? So if next gen's coal and steel is data and trust, whatever disruptive technology might dawn upon us, well, then let us rejoice at Brussels' new rules for platforms. Platforms that seek to untrust us as subjects, again, give up give us digital humanism and sovereignty against state or corporate control, will they protect us against techno-authoritarianism, against algorithmic determinism? We'll see. But in 2030, Europe's invisible digital public space could have become a space where the union nurtured trust for the next generation. We won't have the GAFA, but we will guard the data. Final 2030 headline, the EU bursts out of its iron cage as trans. Trans-temporal, transnational, trans-local, trans-boundary, trans-scale, translational democracy. Fact is, this third generation has democratic transformation in its flesh, has been underway for a while doing it. You know, third democratic transformation after the city-states of antiquity and the era of national parliaments. The youth really are the third democratic transformation. Their participatory imagination starts with little victories of autonomy which connect and spread with retooling democracy for their own purposes, with appropriating the online sphere to derive offline principles of privacy and respect, with offering local public goods through their local activism, care, or energy communities. In short, they are experimenting with futures the EU could embrace. So, officialdom, it's not easy to let citizens take back control inside the EU. But these are doing it anyway. So the EU can sit back and watch their democratic effervescence, or it can be part of the action and make citizen power Europe its new geopolitical sex appeal. Yes, prove it, democratize. democratize. <laughs>
Okay, boomers. Our time is not up yet. Let's talk about peace. My students' conversations always came back to peace in the end. EU is on the ball, right? Uh, Macron is back and Brussels got a brand new strategic compass, as we just heard. But what if we discussed the EU had drank the Kool-Aid and offered next gen the job, job description. EU captain to steer the union through these uncharted post-Ukraine war waters towards new peace. Well, the bad news is apparently they would be quite reluctant to take the job offer. What's the point when you don't really trust institutions? And let's face it, they're not as consumed by Europe as we were, not inclined to swap nationalism of the old kind for Euro-nationalism. But hey, well, a job is a job. So they would cross-examine their recruiter. Peace? Why, they would ask, before the Ukraine war, did you keep repeating that Europe as a peace project is a thing of the past, that it needs a new raison d'etre because the young take peace in Europe for granted? Haven't we grown up seeing kids blown up to pieces from Baghdad to the Bataclan? Aren't we inheriting a world of AI-enabled weapons, outer space wars, and of course, arm export galore. And peace, peace for whom anyway? Peace for our extended neighborhood to whom we have subcontracted the management of our borders and the instability that goes with it? Is Europe not a peace borrowed from the rest of the world? Our precious free movement predicated on ever higher fences against it? What if our refugee-in-chief, Europa, you know, the foreign princess abducted and raped by Zeus, what if she had been on one of these dinghies, pushed back off the coast of Crete in the darkest recesses of European law, the very first target of double standards? What would our continent be called? Hmm, these questions might put the pragmatic recruiter on edge. Next gen just don't get Schlark liberal hypocrisy. The necessary distance between aspiration and reality. And they have no experience of multilateralism, right? The EU big thing. Not true. Hear me, recruiter. Haven't you watched the screens? Social multilateralism is in their DNA. See how they can take part in two, three, four, five threads at once with different protagonists in different registers? They are experts in the politics of recognition as their software instructs a sort of casual tolerance at their best not even about putting themselves in the shoes of others, a la Ricoeur, but about creating the common ground where everybody feels comfortable in their own shoes. You know the difference between the introvert and the Finn. You know, the introvert, when he looks at you, he looks at his own shoes. The Finn looks at your shoes. Um, I wasn't going to make that joke. Um. <laughs> So Gen Z's ingredient for the elusive peace recipe includes nurturing relational boundary. We call this the relational approach to IR. They think one planet, one fate, yeah, but they don't worship borderlessness. In fact, their familiarity with boundaries is more intimate than ours as they manage theirs with extreme care. Boundaries that must be affirmed are discarded on reciprocal and f fair terms. So, you see, recruiter, with them on board, a geopolitically awakened Europe would be much more than merely awake. 
it would run the peace marathon on steroids. A rule-based world order, they asked. Well, yes, but of the feminist kind, where fitness measures do not conform to Olympic league tables. My medal, my GDP, my missile is bigger than yours. Strategic autonomy? Yeah, but where autonomies are combined to ward off a sadly, sadly for us, fragmented, splintered world. Market power, Europe? Yeah, but where we apply our internal experience with legal and institutional empathy and other regarding habits to our relationship with the rest of the world. Strategic empathy in action that minimizes unilateral moves, amplifies cooperative designs and investments, and uses its power for the global uplift of humanity. Recruiter, are you seduced? Ready to shake hands? But they have one last ask. And it's not the kind you can negotiate over coffee. Are you boomers on board with Decolonize 2.0? Please don't say been there, done that. Don't say the EU is not its member states, those that colonized in the distant past. Don't say we've atoned plenty since then, channeled post-imperial largesse and normative power their way. Decolonize means so much more, especially now, when the rest of the world feels the shockwaves from the Eurocentric peace bubble and its ethnocentric solidarity. Decolonize means revisiting how we remember the EU's virgin myth mythology, as if they did not first try to unite Europe in order to manage their colonies together. It means stepping out for good from the long shadow of civilizing mission Model talk, moralistic hubris, paternalism, and unilateral universalism. Drop the being humble for being courageous enough to face the world without our club car. It means to decolonize inside too, give voices to the kids of immigrants, de-index West to whiteness. Yes, talk about race. It means reversing the gaze by learning from how others, including indigenous people everywhere, do democracy, mediation, Sarah, sustainability. It means acknowledging that modernity is a global co-creation. The connected local struggles of the youth around the world, victimized by the greed of strong men that Europe pampers. It means disentangling the Western transatlantic bond from the precious universal, universal invocation of liberté, libertad, hurria, zio. Come and join us, embrace decolonize 2.0. In sum, Decolonize means making Europe a true post-colonial power, retooling transnational governance to serve the global south, nurturing tech for peace, and a cosmopolitics life, a cosmopolitics of life, and embracing the kind of planetary politics called for by two billion young people around the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, Imagine if the youth were to become our faces to the world. Their geopolitics of recognition would also be about food, music, and art galore. They would erase the pain of not being seen by Europeans, and they would know okay, when to sorry, say nothing. Sorry, Just be sorry. there and Did listen. Then I don't worry, not too much. <laughs> Anna, that's not true. <laughs> It's unfair. I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. The three ideas of decarbonize, democratize, and decolonize. I thought they were pretty catchy. It sounded really good, actually. Let's hope it uh, sounds good enough for people to actually listen. I felt represented somehow. I mean, with the existential fear, especially. Kind of feeling re traumatized already. <laughs> it's basically all our discussion rounds in one text. 
It's creepy. <laughs> okay, I don't know, I guess. Not too bad for a boomer. Honestly, I think it's too soon to decide yet, because it's not over. Um, let's see how it ends. The things you ignore will we'll knock, knock at, at your, your door. door. Do you hear, Do you hear, hear the, the youth? youth? Do you hear the youth? Listen, Listen to our realities. Even absurdities. Whatever it takes. 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 Whatever it takes to decarbonize. Whatever it takes to democratize. Whatever, Whatever it takes to decolonize. Yes, yes. <laughs> it will take new daring whatever it takes for Europe to be fit for the next generation. And it will take Youth Chameleon EU to do it. Because the young carry decarbonize in their flesh, democratize at their fingertips, and decolonize in their mind. Because they, pragmatic idealists, Know that the earth, not the sky, is our limit. Because they're already fluent in the new language Europe is inventing as we speak. A language that conjures up a progressive spiral of history. The language of circles. Circular economy, circular democracy, circular migration. Agora circles. Circles of autonomy, circles of solidarity tattooed in the COVID generation. And because like the EU, they need both tough love and tender loving care. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in, in expressing a sentiment that I believe all of you share. A sentiment that overwhelms me today more than ever. Gratitude. Gratitude to the next generation, to you. Thank you, thank you for, for reclaiming your passion, with passion, a future we colonize by our actions and inactions, by our decisions and indecisions. Thank you, fit or unfit you, with or without kids for inspiring us to pledge our commitment to a world that will become you. Weird, <laughs> fantastic, exhilarating you. Thank you. That's what we're used to, the whole room. So whoever wants to speak, share their thoughts. Please raise your hand and then one of us will bring the mic because we have all the mics on the stage. I can't see that. Don't, don't be shy. Mentimeter. Yeah, there is also the Mentimeter. Um, and if you click, if you go on mentimeter.com and then put in the code 44035943, you can also join the conversation over the monitor, which might be a bit less intimidating. Yeah. Ah, okay, let's go. Thank you. Thank you for this inspiring talk and thank you for, and I want to make everyone aware that most people on stage are currently wearing a red ribbon someplace. And uh, Calypso mentioned it during the talk, equal pay for equal work. And I want to thank you for doing that. 
because it sounds... Uh, are you familiar with this kind of joke? A Greek researcher, a Spanish researcher and an Estonian researcher walk into a bar. The joke is that they, only can do, uh, they can only do that twice a month because they don't have enough money to uh, after food and rent is due. So, <laughs> we demand equal pay for equal jobs for the EUI researchers and I have, um, I have some leaflets, I'll give it to you. Because currently a Greek researcher receives um, about three times uh, less than uh, someone from the north of Europe. Uh, so the UI is currently fostering in this way a, a Europe unfit for the next generation. And we can work on that and we must work on that. And I, again, <laughs> Thank you for wearing the ribbon, for listening to the researchers' demands, uh, and in total, for being here today, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for keeping the good fight and taking it to your member states. We're doing everything we can here, uh, so absolutely with you. We're all wearing it. And I think it's now my time, as always, as a young person to say, Time is running out, <laughs> do something, but uh, for us it's time to get off stage and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, well done Professor Calypso and your students for what I must say was one of the most enjoyable keynote dialogues that I've ever seen, so congratulations to you all for that, it looks like tremendous work and thought went into what was a very thought-provoking keynote dialogue. So thank you so much.